Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for giving us your time on uh, the Saturday afternoon. Uh, we are very happy to have with us today uh, Laura Beringer and Scott McKnight. They have written what I think is an incredibly timely book, uh, A Church Called Tove, Forming a Goodness Culture. It's backwards in your video, but you can see it. Uh, we will have information for being able to order the book in the Q&A. But first, let me, uh, let me give a quick introduction. This is brought to you today by the Cybert Institute for Church Ministry. Uh, representing the Cybert Institute today is Wilson McCoy. Wilson is at College Hills Church of Christ in Lebanon, Tennessee, where he is the Associate Minister. My name is Miles Wernz. I'm the Director of Baptist Studies here at Abilene Christian University in the Graduate School of Theology. So we're just delighted to have uh, Laura and Scott, delighted to have you all with us today. Uh, a couple of quick words of introduction, uh, a couple of quick words of instruction as we're getting started. We will have the question and answer box open. So as you have questions, as we are going, I uh, would encourage you to drop those in there. Those will be moderated by Renee. You can see her kind of uh, commenting here. Uh, Renee will be feeding the, the questions to us and We'll start off with a little bit uh, letting letting Laura and Scott kind of talk a bit about the book. Uh, Wilson and I will ask them a few questions, but we want to reserve the bulk of the time here for uh, for y'all to be able for all everyone who's a, who's joining with us today to be able to ask questions about it. Um, as I became aware of this book, uh, it and began talking about it with others, it just seemed to be the kind of thing that was resonating with a lot of people that the stories that are told through here about, it's very specific to, uh, to Willow Creek Church up in the Chicago area, but the stories that are told there seem to be resonating with a lot of people, though the particulars might change and the names and faces might be different. Um, just the dynamics of, of power abuse within churches, the dynamics of what it means to be, uh, be hurt by, by those dynamics if you're in a congregation, they, those seem to be far and wide. Lots of people seem to be resonating with them. So just a word to say that as we're going today, uh, we'll be talking about a lot of these kinds of, we'll be talking about not only how to identify some of these dynamics within church, but some of, the, some of these stories that we'll be telling might be triggering for people who have gone through this. So if you have experienced um, abuse through church, or if you have gone through a situation similar to the ones that will be described uh, by Laura and Scott, just to kind of a, a word of a word of warning. These are these are great things. And I'm so happy that y'all wrote this book uh, to give people language to be able to talk about this. Um, but to for us to be able to do this today to be able to offer an opportunity for people to be able to ask questions and kind of dig a little bit deeper with how do we not only identify the toxic cultures within church, but what, what can be done about it? Where do we go from here? Um, Laura is a teacher of first and second grade students. She lives in the Chicagoland area. She is, uh, she is related to Scott McKnight. She's Scott's uh, daughter. She is the co-author of Sharing God's Love, the Jesus Creed for Children, and wrote a teacher lesson and activity guide to accompany that. And she is the co-author of this book, A Church Called Tove, Forming a Goodness Culture that Re Resists Abuses of Power and Promotes Healing. Scott McKnight is currently professor of New Testament at Northern Baptist Theological Seminary in Liesel, Illinois. Is that how you pronounce that, Scott? I've always- Lyle. 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 I like, I like yep, your German even, pronunciation, though. Yep, not even <laughs> close. Lyle, <laughs> Illinois. And has published widely on issues in New Testament scholarship. Uh, his books include too many to name here include the Jesus Creed, Kingdom Conspiracy, Returning the Radical Mission of the Local Church, uh, Reading Romans Backwards, which is an excellent introduction to the book of Romans, and many others. So I just want to start today by uh, asking Laura and Scott, like, how did this book come to be? Why, why this book? Where did it originate from? What did you hope for with it? What, tell us a bit about this, about this and where it comes from. You want me to start? Yeah, Laura, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, you know, it's unlikely that I'm sitting here today because I am a teacher. This is not my trade at all. And so the very fact that I'm sitting here talking about toxicity in churches and abuse is, in my mind, a testimony that God uses very unlikely people 
to um, bring about his purposes. The story started for us when those of us up here in Chicago, many of us can remember where we were when the story broke about Bill Hybels sexually harassing women. I happened to be out to dinner with my husband. My parents sent us the article on text message and we were in a bit of a disbelief about it at first and didn't honestly didn't believe the headlines and then when we started right when we started reading the article out loud we were stunned because we knew the people who were raising the accusations and we lived in this tension of bill hybels and willow creek are saying that it's not true but yet these are people that we know that my dad my husband have known for 20 plus years and it was a really it was really difficult to live in that tension where they're both saying opposite stories of each other and only one could really be telling the truth and that's where it all began for us as we made this phone call to my dad the evening the story broke and for us it was the first time we had experienced um, a story like this but for him he had seen it over and over and was kind of prophetic what he ended what he told us that night that he believed the women he thought it was true and he was hopeful that willow creek would not come out swinging which is exactly what they did and when willow creek slandered these souls that we know um that's really when our involvement in the story began and that's the beginning that's the beginning of the book right so this is the first part of the book is kind of detailing the story of what happened with willow creek what were some of the so in in uh, in looking backwards on your time at Willow Creek then, your, your husband was employed at Willow Creek. Is that part of the, right? He was. He was employed at the Willow Creek Association, which is, um, it's a, an offshoot of Willow Creek Church. It was to bring the Willow Creek model, and I'm probably not saying it correctly, but bring Willow Creek to the rest of the world and help local churches um, develop curriculum and, and so forth in their own communities. So he knew one of the women, Vonda Dyer, was one of the first brave women to give their names to the Chicago Tribune. He knew Vonda through his time on staff. And he, he, said, he said right away, there's no way that Vonda Dyer is lying and making up this story. There's no way. And um, it was personal to us because we knew these people and, um, we felt that they were being wronged by the way that they were being treated by this church, but yet they didn't have a platform. Willow Creek was, was slandering them globally, and yet the women didn't have a platform for, for telling their story. And Miles, I, uh, I had gotten involved in three ways, uh, in conversations with Lauren Mark, of course, but then I sat in an airport and drafted out a couple pages of my thoughts on this, just because I want, I, you know, I'm a writer, I, uh, I think by writing, and I was able to get my thoughts in order by putting it on paper. Then I, that turned into a blog post, a few, uh, maybe three months later, and another blog post or two in the summer. But then um, I was reading a book on, on pastors at the time after Hitler and after World War II, and how German pastors rationalized their involvement in World War II and diminished their complicity. And I was amazed at the patterns of cover-up and the patterns of what we call now false narratives uh, that justified and rationalized and, and legitimated how they responded and actually sometimes lied about how they were involved. So uh, that, that led to, um, I thought, we've got an angle, this is something we have to talk about, but we wanted we wanted the book to be redemptive and positive. And the uh, first blog post or second one had something about goodness in it. So I thought, we'll, we'll I'll explore this idea of goodness to see if it can shed light on this on this very important topic of pastors, leaders, ministers uh, in churches abusing their power uh, with especially with women. And uh, it's, I can't tell you the number of letters we've gotten from people 
and comments we've gotten from people as a result of this project. So we think it's, uh, we think every, every elder board should be reading this book to talk about what's going on in their churches. So in the, the book is, is structured kind of in two halves. The first half, you, you detail the, the, the painful stories of the things that were coming out of Willow Creek and talk about some of the, the warning signs and the ways in which culture develops in a very toxic kind of way. And then in the second half, you turn toward the ways in which Scott, Scott and Laura, you, as you describe it, tov or goodness or this, this, this very rich word that comes to us out of almost from the beginning of scripture where you have God declaring this is that the world is good, this word mm -hmm. tov and how this permeates the, the, the vision of scripture for what creation is meant to be, what the church is meant to be. Um, so you contrast the toxicity on, of, of church culture on one hand to the goodness, of, the, the goodness of what it was meant to be on the other hand, all the while kind of offering very deep, very practical uh, direction and practices on what does it look like to shift a culture that is toxic to one that more closely resembles like the goodness that it was intended for. Um, as you reflect back on your time in Willow Creek, uh, what were some of the warning signs that, uh, that began to show up with respect to uh, the toxic culture? What were some of those things? Is this for me or is this for, for Laura? For either one of you, yeah. Okay, I'll start with this. I mean, I think Laura and I will both say, we didn't see a thing. Uh, I wasn't close enough to see anything. Um, you know, all you see is the persona uh, of performance on the platform. I, I was in Bill Heibel's office one time for 20 minutes. Um, I, I met him one time in the back rooms when we were at a meeting. Um, I was one time flown to Michigan to speak to the elders, but I just didn't have uh, interaction like that. Uh, I only found out about this from uh, former leaders or leaders at Willow after the story broke. And then uh, I would say there are two characteristics of these kinds of leaders that were characteristic of Willow Creek, they're characteristic of other churches. And you can go from the Catholic Church to Southern Baptist churches, to Churches of Christ, you can go to any of these churches and when they have toxic problems, uh, these are two of the major characteristics is a leader who's narcissistic and a leader who proceeds with his power through intimidation and fear. So we, we explore narcissism and um, this is a really serious issue because narcissistic personalities are very ambitious. They're very clever at hiding their weaknesses. They're very good at um, disempowering and erasing and eliminating people who criticize. And uh, they have almost no feelings toward the negative things that they have to say or do. So slander and critique and false narrative is a way of, of propping up the power and what they think is the goodness that they're accomplishing. And then, of course, they use fear. And uh, I really, I really studied this hard. I, I was, I was sort of intrigued by this whole thing of how fear works in churches. But they build circles of safety, or they build circles of, I call them retainers, Miles. I don't know if that's the kind of language it is used, but it is people who will sustain the power of that leader and become loyal at all costs. And they protect that leader and they defend that leader. They report bad people, you know, who are saying negative things about the leader to the leader and the leader works out his power. So these are two of the major characteristics that we saw, but I, I have to say, uh, and I have, I've experienced this with so many people who didn't see it at all until the curtain was pulled back. And then when it's pulled back, all of a sudden, all these people have stories to tell 
And you have to ask, why did you wait till now? Why, why did this happen that way? So this is a part of it. Mm -hmm. You all mentioned at one point uh, in the book that this is a that this isn't just a problem for non-denominational churches like uh, like Willow Creek, but it does tend to be something that happens within churches which are which are freestanding, as it were. Um, so I'm a I'm a Baptist. Wilson is Church of Christ. These are both traditions which are predominantly uh, operate on local autonomy. That they're may be associated like affiliations with other congregations, but for all intents and purposes, the polity is one of uh, kind of, you know, the local church is the, is, is where things are predominantly dealt with and answered with. Um, could you speak just to, for a bit to, so those of us, and I'm imagining many of the people who are with us today come from this kind of world of Baptist or free church or evangelical or church of Christ background where it's it's local it's local autonomy or local polity um what kinds of things should our traditions be watching out for how should we how can we uh how can we work to kind of be proactive in that way you know i i like this question and laura and i have had conversations about it but but this is this is what i would say in general miles in in um, local autonomy church polity baptist church of christ non-denominational if you do not have a really strong, theologically alert, um, let's say godly, wise, discerning elder board or deacon board or leadership team, I don't know, people are now calling these things differently. You're going to have a pastor, you're gonna have a minister who can basically do whatever they want. And, what these people do is surround themselves with people who will support them. And then all of a sudden you have now this group of retainers who are there to support the pastor at all costs because their reputation is involved. Um, you know, this happens at all levels, whether we're talking about presidents of the United States or whether we're talking about churches, it can happen in, in the major denominations, but it's, in a major denomination, a local pastor has accountability to a bishop or somebody above them. In, an inter, in a non-denominational church, in a Baptist church, et cetera, they have accountability often to no one other than people they look up to or who could exercise power. For instance, in the Southern Baptist Church, Al Mohler, Paige Patterson, when he had the strength, had the ability to do something. They didn't have church authority to do it, but they, they have the ability to say something. The, uh, but I, I would say uh, you, they have to develop a culture in which the pastor genuinely is subordinate to the elder board. And if that doesn't happen, it's, it's an opportunity for a narcissist to take over. So Wilson is currently in ministry in Lebanon, Tennessee. Um, Wilson, as you read this book as a minister, what kinds of things did you notice and what kind of questions did you have? Yeah, no, I uh, want to first just say thanks to Scott and Laura for, for the great work, but especially just sharing a part of your personal story. Uh, and that's very difficult. And, you know, sometimes it takes that one person to be willing to share that opens the the floodgates and allows other people to feel like they can share too. And so I think that in and of itself is a, is a huge gift. And so um, I appreciate that and want to say thank you for that. And kind of have two questions that I, I would love to hear from you. One is a more uh, personal question uh, about the author, authors, and then another one uh, follow up to that is a bit more about some, some of the content. And the process of writing a book is a huge investment, especially here. This is a very personal investment. And inevitably, you are shaped and changed and transformed through that process. And so I would love to hear initially, before we jump into some of the, the ministry-specific questions, is how, how do you feel like this journey of writing this book has changed and transformed 
you the kind of leader you are in church or the kind of member that you are in church? Um, I'd like to hear about that personal transformation first. I think I'm still processing it, to be honest. I Sometimes I'm driving to work and I'm teaching kindergarten this year. And I'm still astounded that here I am talking about church abuse on a Saturday. Like I said at the beginning, it's a very unlikely story for me. And it, it can be jarring at times. I live in the world of kindergarten all day. And then I come home and I shift my focus to a church called Tove and read letters and messages from folks all over the country who have written to say, to share their story. I think they feel safe sharing because of the book that we wrote. Um, So, and we haven't even gotten to be in church since our book came out because of COVID. So we haven't really seen our community. Um, But yeah, I think maybe in a a few months I can answer that question more specifically, but I feel like I'm still processing Mm -hmm. Um, the opportunity that I've been given. And the other side for Laura is Laura has become a strong advocate for women who are, let's say, uh, abused sexually or with power in churches. She, she seems to see what's going on and goes, she jumps on that question and sees through a lot of what is being said and mm-hmm. the false narratives that are being propagated. So um, you know, my students, I, I have a lot of female students who are, some of them working in churches and some of them plan to work on churches, some of them not at all, uh, but just want to study the Bible. And they all know Laura as an advocate for women. And uh, so I, I think that's, Laura's been given a voice by, something, by working on this project. Something, Wilson, that's been, again, I feel like I'm still processing it is, I've been the target of quite a bit of anger um, from, especially from folks on the inside at Willow Creek, even just recently, they're angry that I wrote a book with my dad and um, I'm just, you know, profiting off of their pain. And um, that's been a really interesting journey is it's, it surprised me at first, but you know, people told me you're aligning yourself with the wrong side, or um, I was sat down in Starbucks and, you know, told that I needed to be quiet. And what I've, what I've really learned to process or what, what has helped me through that journey is um, just everybody, not that I wish this on anybody, but anybody who's been a whistleblower or the women themselves, um, we're, that's not a that's not a unique phenomenon as being the target of anger, um, and I, so I've taken a lot of solace in that. And um, my dad also has been saying, "It we don't be surprised by it. That's what's going to happen." But it can be hard at times. Yeah, and and, and that and I appreciate you sharing that. That leads really well into the the more ministry specific question. Um, one of the big themes or kind of two of the big themes in the book are uh, culture and power and this idea of helping ministers and church leaders to become aware of the cultures that are present in their church that culture isn't something outside of us but within our communities of faith Uh, there's a culture and there's a climate and the leader's position has a huge impact on that And that's a really powerful position. Uh, And one of the authors that you reference a lot um, throughout the book in regards to that's Andy Crouch, uh, who wrote Culture Making, but he's also written this other book uh, called Playing God, uh, which has been a a really personally important book for me. And one of the big concepts uh, in that book is talking about power and how we use it. Not that it's inherently bad, but we need to be good stewards of it. Uh, And the phrase he uses is, power that promotes flourishing. Um, And one of the false narratives that you talk about in the book is uh, power that's used to promote fear. Um, And and that, I think, is a helpful contrast of how ministers can use the power that they do have. Number one, to be aware of it, uh, but then to ask those questions of like, am I using this towards fear or using this towards flourishing? And I would like you to kind of reflect in that more positive flourishing direction and talk a little bit about 
um, what it could look like uh, for a minister to use the power that they have, the leader to use the power that they have to create a flourishing environment for all the members of their church. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, Wilson, this is a really important question. And I, and I don't, I don't, because you're a minister, uh, you might realize how significant it is. But as a professor who's not a pastor, uh, I think this is a bigger question than most people realize. Let, let's just say that power, uh, I, I want to say first that, that culture is the color of water in our church. We need um, uh, discernment skills, and we almost need to develop, uh, I don't know, books or some kind of device, skill, technique to discern the culture in our churches. And uh, I'm not quite sure all the questions that have to be asked, but I'm willing to work on this topic and think about it more. But I, I think we need we need discernment of culture. But on power, I think there's three ways to look at power. Uh, there's probably more, but three that I've I've become accustomed to talking about, and they're prepositions. There's power over, there's power with, and there's power for. Uh, the toxic church cultures are hierarchical to the core even if they like to pretend they're not, you know, that the church is run by deacons. Uh, I can tell you within 30 minutes of being around the pastor of the, how much the church is actually run by deacons. So, but so there's power over creates hierarchy and lines of reporting and they draw these things in vertical ways. So, so the head leader is up here. I, I often wonder what would happen if they if they designed it the opposite way. You know, if the leader, the pastor, the elder board of however, uh, I know there's a lot of churches of Christ out here, and I've been with you people a lot, and I know you're nervous about the word pastor, so just forgive me. Um, I'm an Anglican, and we we even have priests, so now it's really troublesome. But what if we put these at the bottom? and had all the reporting okay then i so there's a there's a hierarchy with power over and power over often results in fear mm. okay a second one is power with power with is a sense that people get that let's say the pastor the minister the leaders the directors whatever group of people you have in the church doing ministering are alongside one another, working together. This is a really healthy, uh, this is Tov. Uh, power over is toxic. The only power over we want in churches is God, is Christ, is the spirit, is scripture, church tradition. That's the only place where we have power like that. Um, so power with is together. And then I think that the ultimate secret to the use of power is modeled by Jesus in um, Mark 10, 45, 10, 35 and 45, Philippians chapter two, it is power for, it is to use our position, uh, whatever it is, our gifts for the sake of another to make them or to help them, to nurture them, to become uh, the person that God called them to be, to nurture them to become what they're gifted to be. You know, I tell my students, they'll write me letters. I talk to them in class about this. I know you're really busy, but can I ask you a question? And I often say to them, now look, I'm your teacher. My job is to work with you. I'm not too busy for you. Yes, now if you, you call me and I'm in another meeting, I, I am busy, but it's not because I'm busy. It's because that slot is not open right now. But I think we have to learn to disperse our giftedness, uh, if we want to use the terms power, to empower other people. So I'm, um, I'm a strong advocate for women in ministry. I like to use my platform and share my platform with women who write on my blog 
Um, it gives them more voice. It gives them more opportunity. I think a lot of ministers, a lot of pastors, a lot of platforms need to be seen for the political power that they are, and they need to be shared. Uh, when, a, when a preacher is unwilling to let anyone else behind that pulpit, uh, you have power over. That's a political message of power, polity, you know. Uh, we, need, we need to use power for. That is what Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom, here's the word, for others, for many. Philippians chapter two tells us that Jesus left equality with God for to become like us, even to the point of a cross, so that we might be uh, redeemed and brought into the presence of God. So he used all he was for the sake of others. That's, that's to me, that's what power is about. We've got a number of good questions coming in uh, from our the folks who joined us today. And as you have those questions, please go ahead and, and put them into the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many of these as we, as we can in our time together. Um, I kind of want to piggyback off of uh, off of Wilson's question about church leaders, and I want to maybe flip it around to uh, what this might look like for congregants. So one question that has been has come in here, how might a young person of no reputation bring awareness to the abuse of abuse to a congregation that is mostly blind to what's happening? So it's one thing for a minister to to develop cultures of care or to kind of bring things to light or to to lead by example, but what 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 do we what what might there be for those in the congregation that feel like they don't have that platform, they don't have that position to be able to to do anything? That was me. I had no platform or position to do anything. Um, I mean, I my father happens to be a theologian who does have a platform, so I pushed him to talk about it. I know not everybody has that position, but. Something that I have noticed over the course of our research and study is that sometimes it takes outsiders to see it, to a person who's inside and sees it and nobody else will listen to them. Sometimes it does take somebody on the outside to speak truth to the situation because nobody inside sees it or is looking at it. Um, and I, I totally agree with Laura. I, I do think, uh, most of these people are going to have to find someone who has a voice. Um, and uh, I, I, I believe that outsiders are more needed than in many churches than, than insiders. And we've, we found this with churches that are doing so-called investigations. Independent investigations were actually slanted because they got to choose the people who were going to do the investigating, you know? It's like, uh, it's like asking... Uh, the Dallas Cowboy uh, coach right now to investigate the, fo the football team by appointing one of his best friends to see if the coach is doing a good job. I mean, it's not going to be fair. Uh, so we, we need we need some outsiders. Um, but I I believe that um, most people in most churches. All right, let, let me say it this way first. Just because someone thinks something toxic is going on in a group does not mean that it's toxic. Some people think uh, that any decision made by a pastor is the result of a toxic church culture. And it's not true. There are some toxic cultures and there are some tov cultures. And doesn't mean that just because someone calls it toxic that it actually is. So I would say that people who are tov or who see toxicity need to make a commitment, first of all, to themselves to be as tov as they can be, and to find other tov people, enough of those people that they can form a pocket of tov, not a pocket of gossip, not a, but a pocket of tov where they're doing the things that we uh, talked about. And there's other things. Let's say you do the fruit of the spirit or the beatitudes. We talk about empathy, grace, putting people first, telling the truth, pursuing what is right, doing the right thing or justice, serving and being Christ-like. Committed to that, a group of people like that, that forms 
Um, we would we would encourage people to to buy a book like this to give them language, um, to give a book like this. Laura did a giveaway the other day. I thought was pretty clever. Is that we'll give you a book, but you have to give one to your pastor as well. And I, I think uh, leaders in churches need to become aware of this. So I would say for the congregants, become towed, um, work with other people who are towed, and recognize that church cultures don't change because you want them to. They change over time toward towed by people becoming towed and so much towed existing that they discern the presence of toxicities. I think that's, uh, I appreciate you saying that, Scott, because one of the things that I appreciated about uh, you and Laura's work is the the hopeful trajectory that you move towards as the book progresses. And um, and I really appreciated that. And, and just even that charge or challenge to congregants, I think it's a good reminder that a, a church never just has one culture, uh, that it's possible to create subcultures that can have a leavening influence. Um, and so not all hope is lost. If there is this broader culture, there's still the possibility to create these subcultures that hopefully will have this expansive um, possibility within the church. Um, one of the other questions that I had noticed in the Q&A that um, is, is similar to a, a situation in the history of our church, and would be curious to get your thoughts is regarding um, the history that a church might have where forms of sexual abuse have happened in the history of that church. Uh, sometimes those can be within the last two years, but then sometimes it's a decades old occurrence. And I'd be curious to know, in light of one of the questions, do you have any, in your research and in your writing, any advice or wisdom about how do you narrate the story of a church with those instances and occurrences as a part of the history of that church? Um, how, how might a, a leader narrate the history in such a way that that acknowledges it? Or do you have any other thoughts on when and how and the, the history of a church? Well, I, I don't know if Laura wants to answer this. We, we had great conversations about this, this idea um, at times. Um, if, if you don't narrate this story, you are not narrating the story of your church. The, these stories have to be told. All right, now here's, here's something that I've noticed. Um, and I will, uh, I will um, brag a little bit about the Anglican tradition here. In the history of the church, liturgical churches have a habit, a practice of, of confessing their sin. Every Sunday, we publicly confess our sin. There are a lot of churches that don't do this. Most non-denominational churches, I would guess most Baptist churches, I don't know about the Churches of Christ, but I'm guessing they don't have a weekly liturgy in which they confess their sins, okay? I believe that this is a mistake. Um, now, in the Churches of Christ, you have communion weekly. Uh, a lot of Baptist churches only have it maybe four times a year. Whenever you have communion, you should be confessing your sins, but it's very private. And, and this is where Laura and I, we, we were irritated when we discovered that Willow Creek wanted to move on. They did not want to talk about this story any longer. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you cannot tell the story of Willow Creek. No one will ever tell the story of Willow Creek or Harvest Bible Chapel, or the Southern Baptist Churches now, or the Roman Catholic Church, without telling these stories. This is a part of the story, all right? It's sad, but you know what? This is the story of Israel. Look at the book of Judges. Look at every one of the historical books. First Samuel, you know, from First Samuel through the Chronicle. 
Ezra and Nehemiah, you just, they just never quite get it right. Acts tells negative stories about the church. Paul tells stories about himself. Sometimes you think these, Paul's kind of proud of himself here, but I think it's wrong uh, the way he pounded on Peter like this. So um, I think that we have to tell the story. The Bible has a custom for this called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Every year, Israel gathered together and confessed their sins. If we have a culture that confesses its sin, it won't be so shaming and humiliating to admit that 20 years ago, a leader did something horrible to a young woman in the church. Now, it's a horrible act, but the church will be ready to say, we are sinful, we need to be forgiven, and they will learn that they need to be a culture that tells the truth. You just say, you know, this was wrong. This pastor was wrong and we have to pursue justice. We're gonna to have to talk to the police and we're gonna report on ourselves. Laura found a story, Tate's Creek Presbyterian, is that the right? I'm looking for it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Laura. No, I was gonna say, I, I'm, I can't find it at all my page flipping, but um, there's a, yeah, there's a church in Kentucky, Tate's Creek Presbyterian Church. The minister's name is Robert Cunningham and he is an example of Tove. He, um, and it, a story came, uh, somebody came forward, a victim of abuse by a former youth pastor at the church. And what was remarkable about the story is that Robert Cunningham wasn't the pastor when this particular Brad Waller is his name, youth pastor was on staff abusing young men. And when, when victims came forward, Robert Cunningham um, it was such a, it, he was so full of goodness. He, he owned the history. He said, even though I was not a pastor at the time, this is part of our church's history. We're opening up our books for grace to do an independent investigation and whatever they find we're going to own. Um, it was such a, I was mo so moved by it because it was kind of the opposite of what we saw from Willow Creek. And he's on Twitter. I still follow him. He's um, he says the voices of the victims are our prophets right now, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's really a remarkable story because he owned the history of the church even though he was not the pastor when it happened. Let me let me follow up with with one of those questions that I think um, is important to create. So how do we get to a place of being able to ask those questions uh, inside a congregation? Um, it, I think it is, it is pretty easy, particularly when people care so deeply about their own congregations, to be very defensive of accusations of wrongdoing, either whether it's by a present minister or whether it's something that the church corporately is involved with, or we, we tend to get defensive about the things which we, which we love. Um, how do we create a culture of accountability where we can begin asking those difficult and incisive questions about something which we love so deeply? Um, I think we need to get knocked off our perch a little bit and uh, recognize, I mean, one of the things that uh, really irritates me um, as a, I, I teach a lot of pastors who are in small churches. Nobody knows who they are. And we get all the glory, all the glory comes to these mega church pastors. So we have raised pastors to pedestals and um, we, we create an, an environment where these people are idyllic and they are, they are perfect. They can't do anything wrong. In fact, there's so much flourishing and blessing in that church. That God has to be a special favor on this group. So therefore they're doing everything right. Let's copy them. Uh, I think we, I think we I think this destroys everything. But what is what is should be measured as faithfulness, um, obedience, love of neighbor, love of God, and not how many people come to your church and how big your uh, budget is and how many butts are in your, in the seats. So I think we need to change at that level. I, but another thing is I think we need to practice the habit of uh, truth-telling with one another. Now, this is uh, 
Miles knows this. This was a big practice of Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his, um, at his seminary and in with, with other people is that they talk to one another about one another, not as a gossip form, but to help one another grow in Christ likeness. Um, I think when uh, that leaders in churches, especially, need to develop a culture in which other leaders can talk to them about their weaknesses and strengths, and that they can do so without recrimination. A narcissist will not entertain criticisms. If you have a pastor, a leaders, ministers, whatever you want to call them, at the top level of your churches, because of the way we form flow charges, who are uh, unable to hear someone try to help them, who is, let's say, an equal, someone who could be trusted to be out for the good of that other person, then you have the beginnings of a toxic culture. We need to start at the top in some levels of practicing the habit of being able to tell the truth. One of the things that I, I one of the, the parts that I really appreciated. So at one point, and this isn't the chapter on telling the truth, you talk about kind of the, uh, the prophetic public action, kind of the, the big splashy statements that are made sometimes. And you say, I think that I thought that this was really good, that you say that the prophetic public action, it has to follow of the other things, that it's not the first thing that we do, but it sometimes may be the only thing that can be done that when we don't have cultures in which, like you say, we can tell the truth and we can say the truth to one another, then this becomes the out, this becomes the only thing that remains is the yeah. big public statement that, to, uh, to call things to account. Laura and uh, I had a lot of conversations about this one. So I, Laura, do you wanna, you wanna talk about this or you want me to? You can start, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, one of the biggest issues that arose in the Willow Creek story was, uh, sort of a plea by the church not to go public. All right, uh, and they appealed to scripture, Matthew 18, the pastoral epistles. You should only go to a person uh, first privately. You know, you're, you're talking now, this was astounding to me. A woman who was abused by a man does not go to that man and say, you treated me wrong and think it's gonna be resolved. This is super triggering. They're gonna be violated again, probably. So um, they appealed to these scriptures. Then when, when the four women went public with the Chicago Tribune, when the leaders at Harvest Bible Chapel, when Southern Baptist, this happens in all these groups, when they went to a more public setting, the church tried to silence them. And um, we, we learned that uh, you, uh, you don't wanna go there first. Now we have call out cultures, cancel cultures. First thing they wanna do is get on their Twitter and start denouncing someone. That's a mistake. In the church, we wanna follow proper procedure. But what happened, we learned at Willow and we learned this at Harvest is these people had been working behind the scenes at Willow Creek for, was it four years? Four Three, years. Four years. And they were getting nowhere. It was runarounds and avoidance and silence and shifting of the stories and refusal to meet for four years before anybody went public. And so when they did go public, it wasn't wrong. It was an act of desperation to protect the innocent. Mm -hmm. This is why some of these women came forward because they were hearing stories of other women who were vulnerable. So um, I believe that we should follow proper procedures, but at some point, if it is not being done right, and sometimes people who think it's not being done right are wrong, but by and large, uh, most of the time, I believe these people who finally have to go public have something to say and to quote uh, an old saying, when there's smoke, there's fire. Something that bothered me a lot at the time about the Willow story was that the elders, the executive pastor, they were all saying, Bill Hybels too, 
you need to follow Matthew 18. Um, we believe it's biblical to talk to the person one-on-one, -on -one, hinting or um, implying that the women were not being biblical because they had gone to the newspaper. And something that really bothered me was all of the people in the congregation that were following the elders and believing what they were saying, because right, you should be able to believe your elders and your leaders who are on stage. And I've since learned, I just finished Diane Langberg's new book this week called Power in the um, Redeeming Power. In oh, the right, yeah. yeah. And she was saying, and I'm, I'm quoting her, but she said, that's actually spiritual abuse when you are causing all of these people in your congregation to follow misguided teaching because you're trying to cover up the truth of a situation. Very good. So I have a question now to kind of turn to the other to kind of turn to the other side here. Um, as you were working on this and as you began to, to reflect on your time uh, in Willow Creek, uh, what kinds of best tool tools or best practices did you discover for caring for the victims? Uh, had, did you find ways that uh, allowed victims to be empowered or assisted in sharing their information or things that, that things that practices which really aided in the victims being tended to? Well, one thing I um, sat down and listened to one of their stories, the most recent woman that came forward. And I sat down and listened to her just tell her story. She talked for about five hours at a restaurant. And she said at the end of the conversation that she felt very loved and cared for just by my sitting there and listening. So I think that's part of it is entering into another and entering into their story and listening and believing them. And they said many times to us, dad, that they did not at the the ones at willow that we know they did not have a platform they did not have a voice so willow creek was recording messages on stage and literally sharing them globally and mm -hmm. the women had no voice they didn't have a platform so they were so thankful to my dad for allowing their voice to be heard um this, this is this is a really good question miles and i wish i had an immediate answer that would be effective but I think the first thing is um, most, in fact, I can't, I can't think of anything unless it's a total church. Most of these people who have suffered either from power abuse or from sexual abuse will not find help in that church in the inner circles of power. That's not where they're going to get it. Though, and I, I know people who've told me I served on a church for 20 years. They decided I was a danger, and we lost all our friends all at once. Hmm. All, it was like they were stonewalled by a group of people who all knew that they could no longer talk to their best friends. Okay, so the second thing is, and, and this is, uh, uh, Laura's talked about um, people who, uh, a, a woman who's talked to her, but I think that they need to find someone who will listen to their story and help them uh, and give them categories and language to describe what they've experienced. One of the pe persons that we've talked to said that she did not realize she was being groomed until her therapist said, you're being groomed. She had no idea. All right. The third thing is I think it should be a psychologist. I think you need to see a therapist uh, to work through this and find other friends in the church that you can trust who won't be moles go into the inner circle uh, that you can that you can talk to but uh, the you know when you say best practices you're talking business language for me and the best practices um, are not that effective when you have narcissistic leaders who have retainers surrounding them protecting them from all criticism so I would say you're going to have to work from the margins um, and work privately and uh, find some pockets of Tove who will listen to your story so that you can find the right time to say the right thing. Sometimes, Miles, what I've discovered is that uh, there will be someone on the, let's say the elders or the deacons who will listen with honesty and say, uh, we need to do something about this. 
All right, that's, that's the beginning of a Tob culture. When that person at that level can then go to the pastor and say, look, this story is true. And this, you've got to stop this right now. And we got to find out what really happened. Uh, that, that can be so healing. But I'm, I'm sorry to say, I, I think that's pretty rare. Hmm. Well, we've got time for maybe one more question. Um, what, and you get into a lot of these things in, in the second half of the book, uh, practices that a congregation can do to nurture empathy, to nurture people, to nurture truth telling. Um, how do, can you offer maybe some wisdom for churches that are wanting to move from kind of the platform persona that really encourages the dynamics that you're talking about, like the power dynamics that you're, that you're wanting to move away from? How does a church move from kind of the platform persona to a, maybe a more healthy persona or a m more healthy culture? Um, you know, a platform, uh, let's just say a platform persona culture is, uh, took a long time to develop and, uh, a dispersal of that, uh, persona into a more, let's say shared platform persona is going to take a while, but I believe that, um, that, that platforms have to be shared that the minute people begin to see their pastor as a hero and a celebrity, we have major problems. And we need to, um, I just wonder how many of these mega churches could exist without um, a super gifted pastor who probably can't be succeeded. And how many of them are sharing the platform enough that when they leave, no one will miss them. I mean, some people are going to miss them personally, but uh, that is a, that is a major issue that our church, because this mega church phenomenon is not that old, and uh, the the record of successors to mega church pastors is uh, is abysmal, and most of them really fall off because they were so built around a single character, and I and I think that. Uh, they, they need to have um, a shared platform and maybe a pastor take off six months to let someone else's uh, persona or, or uh, gifts come to the fore for that church and get rid of the idea that uh, we're coming to the church to hear so-and-so. And when that so-and-so leaves, we're no longer coming back. That's not what church is. Church is a people in fellowship with one another, not coming to church to hear uh, a mega church pastor give a mega sermon. And I, you know, look, I know they are really good at what they do. And a lot of them are brilliant. Uh, so I don't know, this is a hard, a hard one, Miles. Yeah, these are hard questions and without easy answers. Um, but I think that what you do in the back half of the book with respect to the the various practices that a congregation can develop. I think that is a wonderful starting place. And like you say, changing the culture of a church is something that takes, uh, takes a long time and it requires ministers to remain in it for the, for the long haul yeah. to be able to, to shift a church. Well, I want to thank Scott and Laura for being with us today. Uh, we're coming right up on that one hour on our, on our time here. So, uh, thank you so much for devoting, giving us your time this afternoon. And I know that everyone here has appreciated uh, being able to reflect on this some more. We've put the information for ordering the book in the, in the chat box here. Uh, so Wilson, do you have any, do you, do you want to say anything before we head out here? Well, I just want to say again, thank everybody for their time and especially for um, Scott and Laura, the, the final, I guess, takeaway for me from the book or one of many was, you know, I think this book places a big onus on leaders to, to do their work and to become the kinds of people, um, to become the kinds of men and women who uh, are people who people can share their story with and become the kinds of ministers who are willing to speak and, um, if you don't deal with your shadows as a leader, that will shape the culture of your church. And so I think 
Um, one way that ministers can, I think, immediately move things in a right direction is, is to begin to, you know, tell the truth to yourself and to be very honest. And, you know, my wife's a therapist and so I'm speaking from that angle, but, um, but it matters and it's important because when, uh, people in leadership don't do that, it has a wake in some really toxic directions. And so to me, that's a, that's a closing challenge for, for all church leaders who, um, whether they choose to read the book or not, and I encourage them to do that, that, that just needs to be, I think, a constant refrain for leaders. So thank you, Lauren Scott. Yes. And thank you, everybody, for the wonderful questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to answer everybody's questions, but uh, thank you for coming. And uh, the video will be available online uh, soon. I, we will send out an email to everyone who is registered to kind of indicate that to them when, where they can go find that. I uh, also want to say a word of thanks to Renee Paul, who is with the Cyber Institute for all of her technical abilities. This would not be possible without Renee. So thank you, Renee. I know you're, you're on silent there, but thank you anyway. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for a one, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your Saturday afternoon. So thank you for joining us.